Our story takes us beyond the polar circle, from Moscow to the island of Lyakovsky, lost in the Arctic Ocean in the middle of the Laptev Sea. Although mammoths became extinct long ago, their tusks, skeletons, and sometimes even their frozen carcasses are frequently found. The greatest number of these exceptional discoveries are in the frozen grounds of Siberia. According to some scientists, mammoth remains there could number as many as 10 million animals. Ever since the ban on elephant hunting, the Russians have cornered the market in ivory. Six thousand kilometers from the digging sites in the Great North, in Moscow, Nikolai deals in mammoth ivory. His work consists of finding customers in Asia interested in buying raw ivory, as well as having all sorts of objects made in Russia and in China using this precious material. This tusk is 3 meters 80 long and weighs 100 kilograms. It sells for 250 to 300 dollars a kilo. The tip of this one was exposed to the air and erosion has caused it to begin to crumble and disintegrate. This tusk is a collector's item. This tusk is worth about a thousand dollars. This one's not that long, but it still weighs 10 kilos. My business is perfectly legal, but to ship just one load of ivory, I have to fill out 50 different forms. Obviously, others prefer dealing in contraband. These bags contain about a ton of ivory fragments of varying quality. It's not an easy business, but we work with mammoth tusks to protect the African elephants. Nikolai, in his business suit, is now in his office where he divides his time between his computer and his busy appointment schedule. My company was the first to sell mammoth tusks and Paleolithic bones via the Internet. Selling ivory at an average of $50 a kilo creates an annual global market of 50 tons and a $2,500,000 turnover for all of Russia. Moscow and Hong Kong are the cities I prefer. They're dynamic, and things happen fast there. Doing business in Russia isn't easy, but nothing is impossible. I make a good profit from what I do. Nikolai is always in a hurry. To get where he's going faster, he has no qualms about using the tramway lane. Today, he has an appointment with his associate, Dmitry, a paleontologist who organizes expeditions to remote areas in the Arctic. <laughs> this is Dmitry, one of our best paleontologists. His interests are both scientific and financial. We're associates because we complement each other. This mammoth skull weighs about 90 kilograms. It had to support a pair of tusks weighing 90 kilos each. The skeleton was discovered on Lyakovsky Island. All the bones are from the same animal. 
такая у них жизнь, они так зарабатывают. The people of the Great North find these. That's how they earn their living. Могут позволить. Sometimes they bring back pieces that scientists can use, or museum pieces. All of these bones are mammoth skeleton fragments. They're treated to prevent any change from their exposure to the air. Of course, all of the world's museums want to possess an entire mammoth or dinosaur skeleton. The woolly mammoth is one of the most emblematic animals of prehistory. It adapted to the Siberian climate and then became extinct 10,000 years ago, except for some specimens that survived on an island northeast of Siberia until 3,700 BC. This discovery increased the mammoth's existence by 6,000 years. And so this mastodon, a contemporary of Paleolithic hunters, lived until the period of the pharaohs in Egypt. Tixi is a small strategic city on the Arctic Ocean that had its moment of glory during the Soviet era. In the 1940s, the population was more than 42,000, Today, there are less than 10,000 inhabitants. This town, at the end of the world, is the departure point for Dmitri's expedition. Several tons of equipment are loaded into an army helicopter. Dmitri has to get back to Lyakovsky Island, where his team has been working for two weeks. Weather conditions are good, and it will take two hours to cover the 250 kilometers of ocean that separate them from their destination. The helicopter is filled with equipment and food. The flight costs $1,000 an hour, and so careful calculations are made to keep shifts down to a minimum. We've already got a good load of tusks. We're waiting for you. We've got some problems with the motor. Over. Okay, we're ready to land. Over. The helicopter touches down on the muddy Lyakovsky Island Earth. An expedition to the island requires local authorization and permission from the Russian Natural Resources Ministry. These rudimentary barracks are home to the ivory hunters during the two summer months. Although Dmitri organizes these expeditions to collect ivory tusks, he nevertheless has a passion for science. He knows that this island contains one of the world's largest mammoth cemeteries.
A long time ago, in the summer, there was a very dry steppe here on which a lot of grass grew, making it an immense prairie. In winter, the heavy snows covered all the vegetation. Thanks to their huge plow-like tusks, mammoths could clear the snow and thus find food. Wherever there are a lot of carcasses, it means that life was once very intense there. Here we can see the Earth's deterioration because of the water that flows during the thaw. What might appear to be dirt is actually the clay-like earth itself, which comes from the melted ice. Erosion causes the frozen earth to melt and crumble, and often the tips of the tusks emerge from the ground, and getting them out of the permafrost is really an exhausting job. I managed to get free. Today, several teams each leave separately along the frozen coast. We're leaving to observe the coast. We'll split up into two teams. And if we see something above the ice, We'll note it on the map and come back later with the right equipment. The day has just begun. Fedya, the base leader, takes Dmitri to the site of an extraordinary discovery. Two weeks ago, a tusk was found along the coast. Erosion has done its work, and it's now possible to totally free it from its prison of ice and mud. To do so, Fedya has brought the necessary equipment. At this point, a motorized pump will send seawater under pressure to melt the ice holding the tusk. The men, wearing rubber boots, have to climb the icy and muddy cliff. It's dangerous and tricky work, with overhangs of unstable earth threatening to fall on the hunters' heads at any moment. In addition, at this stage of operations, it's important to avoid damaging the tip of the tusk. After spraying it with water and cleaning it, the tusk's magnificent color appears. We'll have to come back with different equipment to see what's behind it in the ice. Sometimes we find one or several in a day, and then on other days we don't find anything. But the one we found is a fabulous tusk, and it's a very rare one, too. We're really lucky.
This collector's tusk weighs more than 80 kilograms. It was brought here with great care and then buried under the sand with the others to protect it from the open air. The evening meal is the time for hunters to get together and talk about their finds and about the day in general. <laughs> <laughs> we walked about two kilometers from the base up to the first stream. And there was a tusk 20 or 30 centimeters above the ground. It was pretty long, but the tip was already damaged by erosion. Still, I think it's a great piece. Another one was 50 or 60 centimeters exposed, and the rest is still stuck in the ice. If we wait a little, I think it'll be easy to get it out. In 1750, not far from the coast of the Arctic Ocean, a merchant named Lyakov discovered two islands covered with animal remains. In his honor, the islands were named the Big and the Small Lyakovsky. The Tsar gave him the exclusive privilege of exploiting the mammoth ivory. Ever since, expeditions and discoveries have considerably increased. Most of the specimens can be seen today in the Natural History Museums of Moscow and St. Petersburg. Stalin gave the order to civilize the North, which was rich in natural resources. In successive waves, men and women left for the Great North. The Soviet Union invested fortunes in the construction of cities and ports to open the Northeastern Maritime Route, important not only for Russia, but for international trade, since it's the shortest link between the West and the East. Numerous geological and geographical expeditions were organized to most of the Russian Arctic islands. These men became heroes because of their enthusiasm and courage in facing the unknown. Without them, the Great North would not have become as important as it is. They created polar bases and radio navigation, set up drilling and launched scientific research linked to the mammoth. New specimens were constantly being discovered and taken to national museums. It's thanks to the first Russian and Soviet polar expeditions that Dmitry and his team are now able to come here, six time zones from Moscow. Alexei Tikhonov, one of Dmitry's colleagues, is at the Paleontology Museum in St. Petersburg. The Russian Academy of Sciences is in favor of mammoth ivory trading since it helps finance scientific expeditions. You can find mammoth remains in fairly large quantities in North America, in the western part of Russia and in Europe, but you only find the bones there. To find bones with flesh still on them, you have to go to Siberia. 
Безусловно, одними из самых интересных находок являются те, которые... For scientists, the most interesting discoveries are those which help us to understand the mammoth's way of life, how it lived and nourished itself. And thanks to certain analyses, we've been able to find partially digested plants in their internal organs. The only entire adult mammoth discovered, the Adams mammoth, was found in 1799. After that, baby mammoths from the Magadan region were discovered. The others are only fragments of skeletons with some of their flesh and hides. And so in 200 years, only one whole mammoth specimen has been found. On these shelves, you can see mammoth bones, jaw bones, and teeth. The room is unique. Scientists who participate in expeditions trek through the tundra, driven by a true passion. It's a research terrain they know well. Looking for tusks every summer means suffering. In hostile regions, they have to hike for dozens of kilometers in the tundra. The number of tusks they find depends on the number of kilometers they travel along the banks of the lakes and rivers. Sometimes an expedition can end in tragedy. Last year, one of the men got lost and never came back. The mammoth's disappearance was no doubt due to changes in climate. Its long incisors were formidable defenses. The mammoth was an herbivorous animal. Accustomed to a cold climate, its body was covered with a coat of wool and hair that was up to 50 centimeters thick. 10,000 years ago, the planet warmed up. The steppes were transformed, the tundra became swampy. Trees began to grow, and the mammoth was unable to adapt to the changes. The radical change in its environment was undoubtedly fatal to the woolly mammoth, although its total extinction remains a mystery. For Fedya and his team, stranded on Lyakovsky Island, fighting winds that often reach gale force, things haven't changed since that initial heroic exploration period. Their equipment is old and outdated. They have to manage with what they've got and are constantly repairing their various vehicle motors. They can only count on themselves. The tundra is full of sand. That's why the vehicles are always breaking down. It's old equipment, but we've got to make do with it. Where else can we work? We've got to eat. <laughs> Stop! You're going to damage the rubber treading. Today, in spite of horrible weather, a team is leaving with its Caterpillar vehicle for a corner of the tundra where a tusk has been spotted. The vehicle's cabin isn't big enough to hold all the men. Some have to ride on the roof in spite of the rain.
After several hours, the strange convoy comes to a halt. This time, the ivory hunters use a different extraction technique. After freeing the tip of the tusk, they ignite a small wood oven. Since the combustible is not totally dry, they use fuel to start the fire. A few days ago, two of the men happened to find it. They loosened it a little, and, and now we're going to finish the job. After having cleared 50 centimeters of earth, they set up the oven. The pan heats the water and gives off vapor. This vapor will gradually melt the frozen ground around the tusk. <laughs> Throughout the day, they repeat the same movements several times before going back to the base at nightfall. I'd heard about mammoths, and I wanted to see this and discover something too. When you find one, it's a real joy for you and for everyone else. It's really special. To live in these conditions, you've got to have courage. If you don't, it's impossible. The slopes are steep. It's dangerous to walk below tons of ice and earth. Some men who aren't used to the terrain can easily have a fatal accident. But I still advise everyone to try an experience like this one. It's the end of August. Weather conditions change quickly here, and winter weather could come at any time. The hunters, however, haven't reached their quota yet. Hello, Pasha. Will you be at the meeting? No? Too bad. In Moscow, Nikolai sells raw ivory, but his real passion is chess pieces. In Russia, making carved ivory chess pieces is an ancestral tradition. Several artists work for Nikolai in their workshops. They sculpt unique pieces, which will then be made in greater numbers in China and for less money. Ну, 
I'm in the final phase of the job. Very delicate, and I can't use the drill anymore. I use this tool for the finer details. To make a complete chess game, you need a piece of tusk like this. It weighs about 17 kilos. Nikolai asked me to do this job. I put all my inspiration into it using Slavic sculpture traditions. Russians are very good chess players. What's more, we do really beautiful work. Chess is a part of Russian culture. For a century, all the champions have been Russian. These chess pieces will go for ten to fifteen thousand dollars, depending on the customer I find. Nikolai is getting ready for a very important evening. He's going to have dinner with Anatoly Karpov, the renowned chess champion, and show him his new creations. He's hoping that Karpov will give his work a prestigious image throughout the world. Very few people are lucky enough to hold in their hands an object created from raw material that's many thousands of years old. This is the natural color of the mammoth's tusks. What is the mammoth and the tusks of mammoth? Using mammoth ivory doesn't do any harm to nature, and we're lucky enough to have a lot of it in Russia. It's really extraordinary to be able to make chessmen with this material and to produce pieces that are, that are unique in the entire world. At the same moment in St. Petersburg, an artist in Nikolai's employ is in full swing. Valeria Mokieva is well known in Russia. Her family have been sculptors since the 17th century. Valeria creates original works of art that not many people can afford. It's a truly exceptional matter, soft and hard at the same time, capricious, and contact with it gives you the sensation of heat and life. My collection was larger, but I've already sold a few pieces. And since our museums in Russia aren't very rich, I adjust my prices for them. But if the buyer comes from a Western country, the price of a work of mine ranges from seven to sixteen thousand dollars. In the Peter and Paul Fortress Church, Valeria and her team have recreated an apostolic cross from the time of Peter the Great. The original cross had mysteriously disappeared, and Valeria has brought it back to life.
All of this was made with mammoth ivory. The medallions, the columns, everything. In Peter the Great's time, they used elephant ivory instead of mammoth ivory. You can see a small crack on this medallion. It's actually the nerve that was inside the tusk. Nikolai heads for Hong Kong, the focal point of his business. He makes more money with finished products than he does selling raw ivory. He's come to see his biggest customer, the Deng brothers. They need 10 tons of ivory a year. This white gold is highly sought after for its texture and its durability. Once it's ground up, it's even considered to be a powerful aphrodisiac. It's been in great demand by Asian countries for hundreds of years. We have some, uh, maybe about 600 kilos. Yes. I know. Still in the north. We have no aircraft. Yeah. No, within two months, no aircraft from the north. Right. I other, don't know. Other people, other people can get the material. I don't know. They, they every get month, it. every month, India has shipment. I know. Yeah. Because uh, I want, you know, because now this gentleman has a very few material for him to take pictures. Especially for the covers over in China. No, no work to yeah. do. It's a very bad, very bad situation. Yes, I promise, promise you yeah. to send it next month, no problem. For sure, because next month, but no, yes. yes, we are collecting now. Now okay. we have about yes. 300 up to 400 and collecting material. Uh, uh, so that's not enough. I know, I know. Uh, actually, this uh, Texas we already sold to, to Europe in Paris. For instance, it has just like this. It costs uh, about uh, about ten thousand U.S. dollars a piece. This is one of Mr. Deng's two workshops. People work around the clock here for a much lower salary than in Russia. The Chinese have always specialized in ivory sculpture. It's part of their ancestral tradition. Mr. Deng sells his products to Chinese, American and European customers. Mostly we like to work with, uh, with uh, Nikolai and also we have some other supplier for the material over in Russia. If you put in an email, I had time to think. That's why it's most urgent. I call you by telephone. But you didn't say this Back at the boutique, Nikolai and Deng have a heated discussion about prices, the quality of the mammoth ivory, and delays in delivery. Uh, maybe 50% A, 50% B. So if I'm paying this price, we ever make, we ever have this uh, mammoth tusk. This is uh, more than 100, 100 kilograms. Very rare to have this uh, big size uh, mammoth and uh, one of the best quality. It will take us uh, about eight months to, to, to carve uh, a perfect uh, piece of uh, many figurines and uh, some Chinese uh, oriental designs. Right. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Follow bye. Bye. Nikolai has settled things with his Chinese customers. A stock of ivory should be delivered in three days. In a hurry, as usual, he leaves for Honolulu and other business appointments. The markets in China and Hong Kong are far from the daily problems of the ivory hunters. Today, they leave with their newly repaired vehicle to a site where two men found traces which they hope indicates an exceptional find. Discovering a mammoth is never a humdrum event for these men. It's a very special moment which could reveal information on living conditions and nature in prehistoric times. Today, the hunters are rewarded for their efforts. This is mammoth flesh. It was stuck in this area of the bone. We discovered it by chance, and we're trying to find out what's further on. We might find the skull. It's still too early to tell. We've only found small fragments up to now. Look, these are mammoth hairs. They're worth a lot. Just one hair sells for $15. Look, look, more flesh. Gradually, the hunters remove the ice from the fragments of mammoth skeleton. They piece a leg back together. After a day's work in different parts of the island, the hunters return to the base to unload their finds. It's been a good season. Now it's time to label all the bones and treat the tusks. Tusks that aren't collector's items are cut up to facilitate their transport, but also to determine the quality. This is how these men live, and they wouldn't have it any other way. They could do business or become bandits on the mainland, but they don't see themselves being anywhere else. 
They might say once in a while that these bones don't interest them or that they're not paid enough for their work, but when you see with what care they gather the ivory, you realize that this is the way of life that they like. Здесь ловилась рыба. Ребята ставили сети. Здесь рыба идет. This fish was caught here. My friend set up nets here, and it's been a good season. Я можно сказать практически за 20 лет то, что прожил на севере. I've been living in the Great North for 20 years, and like all real Siberians, I know I can survive in any situation. Nothing attracts me on the mainland. I've completely adjusted to life here. I'm almost frozen in place like a mammoth. If the weather is good, a helicopter will arrive tomorrow to pick up Dimitri and part of the ivory. A big meal with plenty to drink is in order before the team breaks up. In spite of the rain and a powerful wind, helicopters manage to land on Lyakovsky Island. For Dmitri and part of his team, it's time to leave. The cargo is quickly loaded aboard and it's off to the mainland and the city of Tixi. Dimitri is in a chartered plane. Half of it is for the passengers, the other half for the freight. There's no such thing as a regularly scheduled flight here. This rundown plane has logged a lot of miles. It will land in the Russian capital two days from now. Thanks to its cargo, Nikolai can meet his Chinese customers' demands. Tixi slowly begins to slumber in the cold. Soon the polar night will arrive, and it will last for several months. Ever since 1989, when the elephant ivory trade was forbidden, the mammoth has come to the rescue of its distant African cousin. Today, this huge hairy animal has attracted men obsessed with ivory, who trudge through the tundra every summer in search of a treasure imprisoned in the eternal ice. <laughs> 